As both the episode count and creator of Tape Facts enter the early stages of a quarter-life crisis, we turn to elements 25 of the periodic table, manganese. All the usual hallmarks of the transition metals are here. Silvery grey when pure, forms brightly coloured complexes discovered by some 18th century randomo that died mysteriously young after years of licking toxic salt off his embroidered dueling gloves. All of the transition metals have wide ranges of oxidation states, but manganese has 10, the most of any element on the periodic table. At least I thought it was before I read the Wikipedia article for chromium, and iron, and ruthenium, and iridium, and how many elements are there on this thing? Manganese can have an oxidation state between minus 3 and plus 7, which takes it through a range of colours, purple, green, blue, but its most stable state is plus two, which is usually pale pink. Fun fact, right? Well guess what? I completely plagiarised that from an episode of Breaking Bad. Yeah, I just copy-pasted two sentences straight from the script and I bet you chumps didn't even notice. Might just stick on an episode of Better Call Saul and knock off for an early lunch. In analytical chemistry, the most common way to determine the concentration of a solution is through titration. You pour a known volume of a solution into a flask, sometimes with an indicator, and position it under a burette. Basically a fancy long pipette that doubles as an extremely fragile snooker cue in a pinch. The burette is filled with a titrating agent that will, in large enough volumes, induce a colour change, known as the end point. Drop by drop, you add a titrating agent to the solution, and mark the exact instance you get to the end point. One of the most common titrating agents is potassium permanganate, a bright purple liquid with manganese in its plus 7 oxidation state, that I'm sure has brought back some traumatic flashbacks to chemists that had to use it in school. When performing a titration, you have to have the patience and reflexes of a Buddhist monk. If you're even one drop over, you'll miss the pale pink endpoint and get a fluorescent, retina-scorching violet. The colour of the walls in analytical chemistry hell, where you will be sent forevermore to atone for your failure. These days, most titrations in industry are automated. Robots can measure endpoints far more precisely than humans can, and they're less likely to complain when you don't give them sick pay or bottles to go for a wee in. The oxygen evolving complex is a manganese and calcium enzyme that makes photosynthesis possible in plants. Manganese is an essential mineral in both humans and plants, but unfortunately people can't use it to turn sunlight into Findus crispy pancakes. However, if our current understanding of its biochemical properties is well founded, we can use it to make nice healthy bones. In rats, manganese deficiency was associated with skeletal abnormalities, and a 1998 study at UC Davis linked manganese deficiency to lower circulating concentrations of IGF-1, the hormone largely responsible for growth spurts in adolescence. Fortunately for a guy that knows sweet Fanny Adams about biochemistry, this isn't exactly a pressing issue. Manganese deficiency is an exceedingly rare diagnosis in humans. Even if something really weird was going on with your diet, it's not something that most doctors actively look for. You can get more than enough manganese in your diet in loads of staple foods, and if you're deficient in it, chances are you're also deficient in about a thousand other things that are easier to check for. In fact, depending on your job and where you live, you should probably be more concerned with having too much manganese in your body. In the 19th century, doctors noticed that young steel workers were showing signs of an unusual new disease that would later be known as manganism. Early stage symptoms, mood swings and headaches, late stage symptoms, tremors, whispering, monotone speech, a slow shuffling gait, and hypomimia, a permanently muted and mask-like facial expression. Now, medics in the audience may have spotted this condition bears an eerie resemblance to Parkinson's disease, a condition manganism sufferers have historically been misdiagnosed with. Parkinson's disease is most common in the elderly, and is caused by the degeneration of nerve cells in the brain, affecting the production of dopamine. While there isn't a cure for Parkinson's disease, the dopamine deficiency can be treated in the short term by administering a precursor called L-dopa. At least that's what biologists and chemists call it, but apparently in medicine it's called levodopa, because doctors would sooner eat their own turds for dinner than use the same names as the rest of us. Levodopa is a poor treatment for manganism because the root cause isn't the same as Parkinson's disease. When manganese builds up in the brain, the problem isn't dopamine production, it's the brain's ability to release available dopamine into your synapses. At time of recording, the best treatment for manganism is chelation therapy. EDTA, a compound that binds strongly to metal ions, is injected into the patient's bloodstream with an IV drip. If all goes well, the binding agent will, well, bind to the manganese ions, whereupon they can be safely excreted out in the patient's urine. Unfortunately, if the case is severe enough, response to treatment usually declines after a few years, even over a decade after the initial exposure. This is getting very depressing. I suggest we move on to something a little bit cheerier, like the horrors of trench warfare in World War One. yay! In the early 
early 1880s, the English engineer Robert Hadfield was experimenting with materials that could be used to make tram wheels. By alloying the steel with 12-4% to manganese, Hadfield noticed the resulting metal was far less brittle than contemporary steel, and had an exceptionally high tensile strength. The new metal, known as mangaloy, was patented in 1883 to enormous success, making it one of the first commercially viable steel alloys. 31 years later, a posh bloke gets shot in Sarajevo when everyone on the continent decides to start murdering each other. The air over the trenches was thick with bullets and shrapnel, and the military masterminds of the French army realised that soldiers were a lot worse at fighting after they'd been shot in the head. To remedy this issue, French soldiers were issued steel helmets, and it was such a good idea that every other country shamelessly copied them after about five minutes. It's funny how each country approached this issue. The French got there first and made the Casque Adrienne. Revolutionary, trendsetting, and completely useless at taking bullets because of how thin the steel was. The Germans got the M1916 Stahlhelm. Bold, well-designed, and massively delayed due to the mountain of red tape afflicting the German army. And the British made the Mark I Brody. Simple, cheap, and looked ridiculous and badly designed to everyone except the British. Then there's Portugal's variant of the Brody. Look at you go, guys. Who says a helmet can't double as a lemon juicer? The Brody helmet was the creation of John Leopold Brody, a Latvian inventor who had anglicised his name from Leopold Jano Brody after emigrating to the UK. The cask Adrienne was poorly suited to mass production, but the Brody was stronger and could be manufactured from a single sheet of steel. Brody was so confident in his design that during testing, he put one on his own head and allowed himself to be struck with a heavy steel bar. He was even willing to take a bullet from a 45 caliber revolver, but this was deemed unnecessary, either out of fear of injuring Brody or unease over indulging his danger kink. Meanwhile, Hadfield had cemented himself as one of the most influential metallurgists in the UK. He'd been knighted, made president of the Faraday Society, and the archives of the Nobel Committee show he was seriously considered for the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1912 and 1913. When the British Army adopted Brody's design in 1915, Hadfield suggested that the helmet be made of mangaloy to further increase its strength. The Americans would follow suit when they entered the war in 1917, and the modified design would save tens of thousands of lives. Before the armchair historians among you start accusing me of blinkered Britbong bias, I should point out there's a few reasons the Brody helmet wasn't seen much after World War I. The wide brim made it very awkward to shoot with, and it didn't offer much protection to the neck or the sides of the head. When World War II rolled around, old Brody helmets were used by ARP wardens and the police to save money, but even then it was clear the salad bowl design was an evolutionary dead end. The sides were trimmed down to make a new manganese helmet called the Mark III, affectionately known by collectors as the Turtle Helmet. Fits the average British citizen well, doesn't it, the turtle? Wrinkly, slow, suspicious of any food with more flavour than wilted cabbage leaves. These days, manganese is still most commonly used in steel, but there are a few other cool things you can do with it. In medical imaging, manganese compounds are being investigated as non-toxic replacements for gadolinium-based contrasting agents for MRI scans. I didn't even get to talk about the egg-shaped nodules at the bottom of the ocean people have been trying to mine for about 50 years. When will someone talk about the nodules, goddammit? Still, God help me for the next episode. It's been a while since I've had an element as meaty as iron, so please keep me in your prayers as I try to get the script under 10 million words. At least I haven't got any other big chemistry projects to be dealing with in the meantime. Hey there, son. How are you getting on with your computerized games? Frag any noobs on fifth night? I do not frag noobs anymore, dear father. Such simple pastimes no longer amuse me, for you see, I have subscribed to Brilliant! Oh. What's that? Brilliant is a platform where you learn by doing, with thousands of interactive lessons in maths, data analysis, and computer science. Instead of mindless repetition, Brilliant teaches you through problem solving. Now son, I've got no time to learn about maths and computers. As you well know, I spend 70 hours a week sweeping the floors of a textile mill. Worry not, father. The important thing is to learn a little each day, even if it's just for a few minutes. You can even play Brilliant on the go with your telephone. No, 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 no not, not that one, father. This all sounds a bit complicated, son. I don't know the first thing about computers. That's where you're wrong, father. It's never been easier to learn. When I started Brilliant's course on programming in computer science, I knew nothing. But after Brilliant helped me through the basics, I was writing programs all by myself. Goodness me. Maybe I will give it a look. <coughs> I have some bad news, son. That no good Mrs. Thatcher closed the mill. Now we live on the streets. I suppose I can't afford Brilliant after all. Oh, father, do I have news for you. By visiting brilliant.org slash mqtate or scanning the QR code on screen, 
you get a full 30 days completely free. If you want to help Brilliant keep supporting independent animation on YouTube, you can also get an annual subscription for 20% off. Thank you, son. I feel smarter already. Now let's go to our enormous moon palace in our new beautiful rocket ship. I concur, father. I concur. That's brilliant.org slash MQTA. Roll credits.